Hi, my name is Janet, Janet Harris, and I'm based in Sheffield and have been based here for over 10 years. And I'm working with a group called the Sheffield Community Contact Tracers. The group was originally set up uh, a year ago now um, because contact tracing was making a slow start and the group was interested in whether local contact tracing, which is done by local people in neighborhoods, could make a difference. Um, we've published a number of things on it, primarily in the British Medical Journal. We've also started up some other activities. And one of the activities that we've started is something called COVID confidence, uh, which is what I'd like to talk about today. The reason we started it up is because in our conversations with people around Sheffield, particularly people who were shielding, um, were vulnerable for certain reasons, who lived in disadvantaged neighborhoods, uh, who have English as a second or even a third language. <clears throat> we heard the same things over and over again. And what we heard was that the information about COVID is really confusing. And it's confusing for a couple of reasons. One is because it changes all the time, which we all know. Uh, so the government guidance changes when it needs to in response to the epidemic. Uh, the rules about how to manage COVID change often, as we know too. And the science about the virus, we're learning new things every day. So that's constantly changing. And now we have vaccines and the information about those is constantly getting updated as well. Now it's great that a lot of this information is getting updated but it's really tough for people to keep on top of it for a couple of reasons. First of all, they're telling us it's hard to access the information. Now we know that the government and cities like Sheffield City Council have done a fabulous job in terms of trying to get information up on their web pages. But computer literacy is an issue for a lot of people. Um, some people really have never had an opportunity to use a computer. Other people have a computer, but they have poor internet connection. Uh, people may have smartphones, but they may not because they can't afford them. And when they use their smartphone, they usually tend to use it for the things that they and their friends know how to do. So that's using things like WhatsApp or messaging. Um, and unless you're working in an environment where you need to look up information all the time, like an academic environment, a lot of people don't have the kind of searching skills you need to find the information and they don't know what the trusted websites are. So we have um, you know, what Paho calls a real um, misinformation epidemic where things are being interpreted but being interpreted incorrectly. And we also have a disinformation epidemic where there are a lot of people out there saying COVID doesn't exist or spreading myths about the vaccine. So these are two of our huge challenges in public health, which is the area that, that I work in. So we thought, what can we do about this? Um, and I know from past research, um, which isn't just me, it's many, many people, that one of the things that really helps people in this circumstance is something called peer support. So talking to other people like them uh, makes a difference. Um, it doesn't necessarily, being like me doesn't necessarily have to be somebody the same age as me or someone the same um, ethnicity as me. It could be someone that has the same shared circumstance as me, which we all have now because we're all struggling with the pandemic. Also, getting information from people who are local that I might know or that people like me, like my friends might know, makes a difference. Um, and, and discussing it with people who have credibility. So if I'm Muslim, that might be an imam. Um, if I belong to another faith group, it might be the minister in my church. It might be my GP, my doctor. Um, it might be a local person I know who is a health professional. But that kind of credibility also makes a difference too because we're asking ourselves, but what information can I really trust? <clears throat> so we took those ideas and we said, what if we start up something called COVID confidence? And we did last spring. And the aim of COVID confidence is to have online, since that's all we can do right now, really, um, have online conversations with people about COVID. And we decided that we'd like to try starting it up in neighborhoods 
because neighborhoods generally are places where people know each other or know of each other. And you may find in neighborhoods people that are in the same group, whether it's the same social group or the same ethnic group or the same faith group. So we went to the lead community organizations in different areas of Sheffield and they were interested. And with their help and um, their support, we set up regular meetings in each of the neighborhoods where people could have an opportunity to discuss what they wanted to. They originally branded these meetings as training and we were really careful to say, this isn't about training, it's about exchanging information and exchanging experiences because really what we're aiming to do is by having these conversations, help all of us, including us in Sheffield Community Contact Tracing Group, um, make sense. It's a collective sense-making process. How do I make sense of information? So they've been set up now, as I said, for almost a year. And each of the neighborhoods is having regular meetings. Um, between 20 and 60 people attend. We've also found that people from one neighborhood often want to attend a meeting in another neighborhood because they really want to hear the information more than once because it's complicated. Or they want to get tips about how to deal with circumstances that they're running into, issues they're running into. So out of this is coming kind of networking, um, people seeing each other, getting to know each other online. One person might say they figured out how to do something and another person will say, oh, I'm interested in that. So they exchange contact details. So this is kind of informal network of COVID support that's happening on the back of the community-based support that the organizations offer anyway. So there's a few things happening out of this, um, which show us that it's working. Um, one thing that people have been telling us is the best way to have a conversation isn't to march up to somebody and say, hello, I have a leaflet and I wanna to talk to you about COVID because we already get a lot of that through radio and TV, et cetera. It's what's called opportunistic. So that means somebody might, some people um, in one of the neighborhoods might go to the local market which is where a lot of Somali people go to do their shopping. And so it's kind of, kind of already an informal place to exchange information. And while they're there, they'll see people they know and they'll chat to them about all sorts of different things, but COVID will be one of them. How are you managing? Um, what's making it okay for you? Is there anything that you need? Um, there's also a big market in Shepherd like there is everywhere. Um, and People, volunteers are going there to pick up food for food drops. And so there'll be a lot of exchange there of information. Uh, in the food drops themselves, if they're having doorstep drops, that's an opportunity to chat to people. Um, through the contact tracing that's been done, there's another doorstep opportunity to have the chat. So it's all informal and opportunistic. And they say the reason that works is because people don't feel that the information is being shoved at them or they're being told what to do which is really important because we are also hearing that a lot of people have a tough time following the guidance and the information. Um, two quick examples, people who live in multiple generation households, impossible to follow the rules about ventilation, you know, and about keeping yourself safe in the home. Um, also very difficult in multiple generation households for the younger people in the household to understand that going out and coming back in is a transmission risk. Um, the information about um, staying home from work has been a challenge for people who think they may have been exposed. So a lot of the information that comes up in the conversation is about barriers. And when that sort of thing comes up, people can come back into the online COVID conversation groups, talk to the local community organizations and figure out how to help people. That may be how to help them shield, uh, how to help them go and get a vaccine. So part of this is also about not just helping people understand information, but the peer support of, of showing them how to do something, going with them to do it, being with them as they're trying to figure it out. Since Christmas, we've started to ask, do you think the conversations make a difference? Now, if this was academic research, we really wouldn't be appropriate for us to ask people in a casual conversation if we could get back to them and, and tick off a box to see whether they went for a vaccine or not. That's really not an um, appropriate thing to do. But we are getting feedback from all of the community workers. And what they're saying is the conversations 
people might take them with a grain of salt to start out with. And they'll be saying things like, but when I go on WhatsApp with my friends, I get a totally different story about COVID. So, you know, why should I think that this is what I should be doing? But having the conversation more than once with the same person can make a difference. So we've heard stories of people saying, well, yeah, I went back to my friends, I asked them about it, but then I come back to you and you're saying this again. And then I go back and I say to my friends, did you know this? Did you know that? And then together we realize that maybe we should be interpreting this a little differently. So it's changing people's minds. Uh, another thing that's working is they have the same conversation but with different people. So it may be a different worker every time they go to the market or it may be the person dropping off the food tells them the same thing as um, the person they see in the park. And so it's like a consistent message that's coming out from many different people, which really helps to counteract the disinformation or the misinformation that they might fear here in other places. And now what we're hearing from different communities is that a lot of people who said they weren't going to get the vaccine before Christmas have decided to get it now. And they, they've, they've been to get the vaccine. Um, in an ideal world, would like to track that um, through the local primary care networks, um, but that's still something that's being set up. So the uh, simple idea of COVID confidence, which is helping people feel confident about discussing COVID, has surprisingly taken off. Uh, and it's in um, the major neighborhoods in Sheffield now. And you can see that they're mounting their own kind of local informal campaigns to make sure that they get the word out there. So we're, we're really pleased to hear that. In public health, we normally think of these things as with an epidemic or a pandemic as a regional or a national campaign. So the messages are developed from the top down for good reasons, they have to be accurate. They have to reflect what we know about, um, about epidemics and about public health policy. But when they're developed from the top down, most of the time they're not co-developed with people on the ground who are actually going to have to make sense of the information. So I think, and that's quite common across all health promotion, it's not just in England and it's not just in public health. But we do know in, in health promotion that messages that are, that are developed from the ground up are relevant. They address people's needs. If they're co-produced with local people, then local people feel like it's their message. You know, they own it. So the short answer is that at the beginning of the pandemic, I think there should have been kind of a top down, bottom up kind of um, pincer movement in terms of developing the messages where if we're gonna develop one from the top down to make sure that it's scientifically accurate and follows good public health guidance, then it needs to be tested at a really early stage by the people who are gonna receive the message and those people get to tweak it depending on your faith, your ethnicity, um, your, your level of education, uh, your ability um, to manage in English as a second language. And if that is being done now, but it really wasn't being done in the early days. So we ended up with a situation where people down here felt like they were just being told what to do. And then the, the knee jerk reaction is, you know, why should I, why should I listen? I'm tired of all that information. So I think that's a big lesson that's being learned now. Um, and I know that Sheffield isn't the only place that, that has learned that. And here we have some really great stuff happening now, collaboration across the comms, people in the city council and um, people in neighborhoods to tweak all of those messages and make sure that they, they are something that resonate with people locally.